welcome again to Archaeology 3013, Experimenting with Archaeology. As always, we acknowledge the country on which we stand, uh, Noongar Wadjuk country, and we acknowledge their traditional owners, past, present, and into the future, people with whom we work regularly in archaeology. Right, so today is analysis, curation, and also pseudo-archaeology. This is the third section of the lectures in the process of archaeology. So we've been talking about archaeology, or I've been talking about archaeology as a process simply of before, during and after. All those things you do before going to the field or embarking on a project, actually doing the field work and project. And now we go into the final third of, well, what happens once you come back to the field? You've identified your sites and artifacts, you've done your field work, you've brought these things back to the lab. How do we analyze them? How do we publish them? How do we curate them? And how do we make responsible versions of archaeology known? Because there's a lot of crazy stuff out there as well. So quite a lot of stuff to get through, so let's crack on. Last time, just as a recap, experimental archaeology, which starts to fall in both the during and the after, it's a useful bridging side, is very useful in archaeology. It'll come again slightly in today's um, lecture because it allows us to test various hypotheses we have in archaeology. The past is a series of fragments that come to us as artifacts, and as archaeologists we look for patterns in this fragmented body of evidence. And we try and generate a number of hypotheses to account for these patterns. Um, and we then need to test them. There are lots of ways of testing them, but one of the most powerful ways is experimental archaeology, where we construct known experiments with known parameters, and we then compare them to the patterns in the past, and we look for the best fit between modern day experimentation and past patterning. Um, in addition, experimental archaeology is quite useful to people where they're doing historical reconstruction so that we can convey to the many publics we serve what the best interpretation of the day is. Remember, archaeology is a pretty expensive, labor-intensive discipline, and we do need to justify to the world out there what it is we're doing. What we're doing is exciting anyway, so why wouldn't you want to share that? Okay, but for today we have essentially three main parts. There's uh, just a little bit in the beginning about the importance of post-fieldwork work. Before we get into respectively the analysis, there are hundreds of different kinds of analysis. We will look at use, wear and residue. We've done this before, but we'll do it in slightly more depth with some different case studies. We look in a very broad sense at curation and conservation, a whole field in itself. You could run a whole um, uh, unit on that. Uh, you, it, it's a a set of jobs you can get into distinct from archaeology but related to them as well. And then we end off with pseudo-archaeology. And there are some of the case studies, 6,000-year-old Sicilian wine, um, whether to clean or not to clean artifacts, and the Gosford or Karyong uh, hieroglyphs in inverted commas, did we have Egyptians in Australia 5,000 years ago? The short answer is no, um, but a lot of people like that explanation and we'll go through and see why it is incorrect and what a better explanation is. Right, so the importance of post fieldwork work. We all love fieldwork, but fieldwork again is quite expensive, labor intensive, and the saying generally goes that two weeks in the field is two years in the lab. We have to, in painstaking detail, document and analyze all, not just the individual artifacts we bring together, but come to an understanding of all how they all hang together in a site or a cultural landscape. So David Hurst Thomas, I've slightly mangled his saying, but he said, archaeology is not just about finding things, it's about finding things out. And the Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman um, has a whole book on the pleasure of finding things out. And this great quote over here, which uh, helps understand scales of time and human endeavor a little bit better, where he says, we are at the very beginning of time for the human race. It is not unreasonable that we grapple with problems, but there are tens of thousands of years in the future. Our responsibility is to do what we can, learn what we can, improve the solutions and pass them on. And I think that's a really nice way of actually describing archaeological work or any scientific endeavor. We don't know the final answers, not as yet. We are benefiting from work that is done before us, and we're leaving a legacy that other people will do behind us. What is important is that we're very clear about why we are doing what we are doing, 
and how we do it so that our work can be tested and scrutinized by people who come after us. So in the little diagram at the bottom, it's simply you have all the stuff you do before the field, you get into the field, do your excavation, recording, etc. Then you go into some sort of analytical space, generally some kind of lab, a museum, university, consultancy firm, government department, that kind of thing. And then very importantly, we make our work known by publishing it in various ways, digital, internet, peer-reviewed journals, those kinds of things. Um, the first point here just simply says that we learn different things at all stages of this process. We might find exciting individual artifacts at the site, but we know relatively little about them. It's really only when we start analysing them with these amazing techniques that we have that we come to deeper and deeper understandings of what it is that we have found out. Um, and then we let a whole lot of people know about that. So isolated islands of knowledge can be connected into a larger story about the human past. We also have to um, think in terms of why we have collections. So here's a, a photograph of a collection from a museum, pretty typical, racks with all of these boxes, appropriately numbered and labelled as to what's in the box. Um, but we've got to remember that we keep these boxes for a long, long time. And those of you that go into the museum world, I myself have a, a career in museums or have had a career in museums, you've got to think about, well, there's a lot of information to be learned out of these things. We do keep these for a long period of time, many, many years, decades, and in some cases we promise to keep them forever. Because we're evolving new techniques all the time, we have new questions that we ask as we answer old questions, some old questions being answered raise still new questions, so we keep wanting to go back to the primary source of evidence, the artifacts, and we want to test our various ideas. As an example, I have a picture here from Time magazine of a man called Willard Libby. Libby invented radiocarbon dating. Well, he and a team of scientists invented radiocarbon dating, the friendly side of nuclear technology. They developed this in 1947, 1948. And it was very significant for archaeology because before that time, now and again, people would collect bits of charcoal. They would connect collect large pieces because they would thin section them to see what kind of wood it was. Was it a hardwood? Was it a softwood? Was the area around the site a forest or semi-arid? Those sorts of things. So they were collecting charcoal because it preserved information about paleo environments. But with radiocarbon dating coming along, suddenly these humble little bits of charcoal became extremely important because this is easy to date by radiocarbon dating. So everyone had a relook at old collections of sites that could not be dated by absolute means. And they harvested these little pieces of charcoal that were collected sort of as an afterthought. So in other words, we never know what we are collecting, how it might be important in the future. Seemingly insignificant tools, objects, soil samples, all of those kinds of things can be looked at at new ways in, in the future. So the after of archaeological work in terms of how we analyze and then curate, conserve and store our material is extremely important, but it's often not thought of all that much. All right, let's get on to the analysis itself. So an analysis can operate at many levels. It can be very simple. It can be very complex. But let's keep everything simple. Essentially, an analysis is a close observation of something, an artifact, a site, a theoretical question in terms of some sort of larger question about understanding the human past. Um, we then, from this analysis, want to develop a set of hypotheses that help explain that artifact and its function and position at that site. And the trick here is to make sure that your method and scale of analysis suits the artifact, site, cultural landscape, etc. Um, that you're studying. In other words, you're not using a pea shooter to try and kill an elephant kind of thing. That you're using appropriate resources, appropriate questions and appropriate technologies at the scale of what you're looking at. Very often in archaeology we need to move quickly, we need to get results out fast. So our analysis isn't exhaustive, it's indicative, it gives us an idea of what that artifact means and we then move on to other things. Sometimes you have, at the other end, people doing a PhD study where for several years they will study just a particular set of artifacts and they will do a series of very, very in-depth um, analyses of those. So 
we've got a lot of an analytical tools and methods that we can use in archaeology, actually a confounding array. Some of them have been developed in archaeology for archaeology, but many of them, most, come from other fields. We regularly work in groups as part of multi-component teams that understand the past. Archaeology is simply too big and too diverse for any one person to understand it. You as a practitioner need to understand the broad picture and how the process works. But for particular problems, you just need to know who you go to or what entity you go to for help. So we've got qualitative um, type methods. So for example, in historic period sites, we might do a series of interviews of older people or residents or stakeholders in an area um, to find out their, their views. Those would be qualitative. Quantitative is when we measure various things like stone tools, pHs, and all of that kind of thing. What you see on this slide is just a very short list of a much longer list of the different kinds of analytical techniques we have. Materials analysis, radiocarbon dating, 3D modeling, cross-benefit studies, microscopy. You'll see a number of acronyms here. Um, I haven't even added some like OSL and such like in that we use in our analytical techniques. It depends very much on the artifact, on the material, on what your brief for the project is, on your competence, on how much time, money, skill is available for your study. But know this, that there is a huge variety of analytical techniques that are available to you that can help you better understand the archaeological assemblage in front of you. For the purposes of today, we're going to revisit residues and use wear. You get specialists that make careers out of just out of one of these different kinds of techniques. People who look at the soil, people who look at the pH, faunal specialists, paleoethnobotanists, stone tool analysis. Oh, there's just a um, rock art people who do all sorts of exciting things around visualization, 3D modeling, all of those kinds of things. So they're, they're careers in each of those words on the screen in front of you. Um, but let's have a revisit of residues and use wear. So this is what's known as scaffolded learning. It was introduced previously in a lecture and now we go into a little bit more depth in these. So residues, it's worth reading out Richard Fullagar's take on what he calls traceology and the traces left us in the past in terms of residue and use wear. So this is an extract from his uh, chapter in the book Archaeology and Practice. And he goes on to say, residues generally refer to materials that are transferred and adhere to implements in the course of use or preparation for use. We are particularly interested in residues that are transferred to stone tools because they last a long time. Of particular interest is the transfer of residues linked to a specific task, such as harvesting cereals or hunting or processing a particular material, such as woodworking or grinding seeds. However, um, some residues are unrelated to utilization and may reflect incidental contact, burial processes, or even modern contaminants. This is working on the forensic principle, um, Locard's principle. Every contact leaves a residue. You touch something, you leave fingerprints. Um, you hit something, you might need a mark. Um, the, the residue an, an analyst has the challenge of deciding the residues what it is that left them. Were they intended to be there? Was it a knife, a stone tool, for example, used to cut meat regularly and you'll get blood residue on it, which can last many thousands of years, in which case you're happy that that was the primary use of the artifact. But what happens when the archaeologist excavating grazes their finger and their blood gets on it, an incidental transfer, or their trowel scrapes the artifact, leaving a modern mark on an ancient artifact. So they have to be able to, the residue specialists have to be able to distinguish those different things. Some tones, no, let me continue again. Some, to <laughs> Some tool residues can survive intact on artifacts for millions of years. Amazing, huh? While others may deteriorate rapidly and undergo chemical changes depending on their structure and specific taphonomic conditions. So taphonomy are all of the processes acting on an artifact once it becomes part of the archaeological record. It could be water washing through deposit, could be animals burrowing in, could be changes in soil pH, for example. Consequently, specific methods of extraction, identification and analysis have been developed for particular conditions, particular artifact types and specific types of residues. The principles of residue analysis are based on the identification of diagnostic microfossils, chemical signatures, atomic structure, genetic composition, and other properties. 
In other words, through things like experimental archaeology, archaeologists now have a series of reference collections that they can compare archaeological samples to, to see how like or unlike they are to a particular known reference collection. So woodworking tools, working starches, um, cutting up animal hides, those sorts of things are conducted by experimental archaeology, really leave known residues, and these are then compared to the archaeological record, and we see what the best fit is. So that's a very nice paragraph that very succinctly defines residue analysis. Alrighty, there's a short little video, about a three-minute video about organic residues on pottery and other things. So let's have a look what that says. Organic residue analysis is a method we use to identify the composition of ancient, organic, amorphous materials. This can be natural products such as pitches, tars or resins, or food molecules derived from cooking such as waxes, oils or fats. Pottery, such as this prehistoric piece from Korea, are perfect for residue analysis. During cooking, food builds up on the surface of the pot, but also gets deposited within the porous ceramic. Unless burnt on, the food residue on the surface doesn't survive, but the material that gets trapped within the ceramic can persist for thousands of years. It's these trace residues that we need to get to by drilling into the pot. Although the pot may look clean, we have to be sure there is no contamination. We use a clean workspace and remove the surface before drilling deeper into the pot to collect the sample. We take the powder, add an organic solvent and mix it thoroughly. We then place the sample in a sonic bath. The solvent dissolves the compounds called lipids, which is the general term we use for fats, oils and waxes. The solvent pulls them away from the fabric of the pot, similar to the way detergents remove food stains from clothes. Once we have this lipid-rich mixture, we separate it out from the ceramic powder until we have an extract that we can reduce and concentrate before starting the analysis. The extract is placed in a gas chromatograph. This instrument takes the complex mixture of different lipids and separates them out so they can be detected and identified by a mass spectrometer. What we are looking to do is to identify diagnostic lipids molecules that are specific to certain plants or animals and can therefore tell us what the pot originally contained. Here, for example, we have a hunter-gatherer pot from Japan. Now we know that in Japan, pottery was developed much earlier than other parts of the world. And we've been trying to work out the reasons for this using organic residue analysis. Our results have shown that pots like this, but also much earlier pottery, was used pretty much consistently for processing fish. Not only is it remarkable that lipids survived this long in pottery, but the results suggest that early ceramics may have been initially produced for very specific reasons. So while the forms and decorations of pottery have been studied by archaeologists for centuries, organic residue analysis provides us with a totally new insight into the use of pottery that was just unimaginable a few years ago. Right, so that's a great example from the University of York um, about how we can understand uh, lipids better. Oops, <laughs> let's just get back to where we were. There we go. Uh, and they last an amazingly long time. So a lot of that work um, is sometimes outsourced to other labs uh, or it's done in-house. But let's have a look at a case study next. So what you have here is a picture of Tom Loy at Stagfontein, the early hominin site, and he's looking for residues, particularly blood, in that is hundreds of thousands of years old. So that they can be remarkably tenacious. Um, moving through time, we have Utsi, um, the, the ice man, as he's sometimes known, and there's a lot of residue analysis that was done uh, on, on his body and the objects found around him, his flint kit, all of those different kinds of things, in order to determine his cause of death. He was murdered. Um, in Sicily, this is a case study that's going to come up in the next slide. It is about residues on a pot that proves that there was wine production. Blood residues at 90,000 years ago 
at the famous Tabun cave in Israel and then stack them to you. Just a note here on field protocols. So if you're doing this in the field, you'll have noticed on the video he is wearing nitrile gloves, so as not to give any modern contaminants, the fats on his hands, over to the pottery. Similarly, in the field, if you're collecting items for residue analysis, you need to um, wear gloves. You need to have a, a, a sort of forensic kit with you. This is our case study, a really nice one. So it was reported in the press, but it's based on this peer-reviewed scientific article, which has this very long um, name, but essentially what it's talking about are these large amphora found in Sicily. So they are found in this cavern. So this is really nice. It's a closed archaeological context. There is no contamination from wind, rain, and all of those different kinds of things. And you've got these amazing large pots here. So what these researchers did, a bunch of Italian researchers did, is they said, well, what were these pots for? They got uh, samples um, off the pottery to do thermoluminescence dating and from the surrounding deposit and such like. And these turn out to be about 6,000 years old, as you can see, dated to the 4th millennium BC or BCE. So they took five organic residue samples. Now this is important. You don't want to take just one sample. Samples are generally very small. And you want to take a number of samples just in case there are multiple residues, but also to test the reliability of your single sample. Results based on a single sample, people are going to always say, oh, something went wrong with your sample. If you can replicate your findings over a number of samples, well, that's good science. And here, um, one of the, the researchers, Greco, said, uh, we conducted chemical analysis on the ancient pottery and identified the presence of tartaric acid and its salt. Um, known as cream of tartar, the salt of tartaric acid, which is the main acid component in grapes, develops naturally during winemaking. Goes on to say, the presence of these molecules allows us to confirm the use of this vessel as a wine container. And what made this special was this was wine at 6,000 years old, the previous earliest confirmed use of wine in this part of the world was about 3,500 years old. So it significantly advances our understanding of when people, not just when people were drinking wine, so there's part a dietary component, um, but also the people's knowledge of chemistry, for example, organic chemistry in order to produce wine. Um, there were other images like this over here where you've got fibers, vegetable fibers, that are adhering in amongst the pot. And here's just a scanning electron microscope close-up of the different bits and pieces that are on the pot and where they took their sample from, how they did their, their plot, and how the, the mass spec then showed these peaks for the tartaric acid and related salts. And that those are diagnostic, they're like a fingerprint, and they mean wine. So people could say, ah, wine was in these. And in fact, only wine was in these. They were not used for multiple uses. So a very nice case study for residues. All right, moving on from residues to useware, in the same article, Richard Fulligar, one of the pioneers of the science in Australia, um, goes on to say here, useware refers to the wear on the edges and surfaces of an implement that are linked to its utilisation. Microware sometimes refer to a particular approach that employs metallographic microscopes at high magnification, but especially to observe and interpret polishes on stone tools. Traceology is the term that may refer to the study of any traces, whether residues or surface alterations, usually in the context of tool use. However, these terms are often used synonymously to refer to surface modifications that arise during use, hafting, handling, storage. Some forms of use where may incorporate or absorb residues within surface layers, providing a mixture of additive residue and use where traces. The general principles of use where analysis are experimentally based and derived from fracture mechanics, tribology, and related sciences. While potentially applicable to all material classes, including artifacts made of wood, bone, stone, glass, shell, and metal, specific methods and interpretive rules have been developed for particular tool materials, e.g. flint. So you can see use wear and residue go very closely together. So essentially it's again Locard's principle, when you use an artifact for a particular purpose, some trace is left. Whether we can see that trace or not is another question. So in terms of, of Richard's scientific approach, we also have Chris Capel, who's a museum person, also talking a bit about the surfaces of objects, and he puts it in this way. He says, the present surface of an object is an arbitrary effect of man, meaning all people, uh, women and children, and nature. The present dusty, damaged, rusted, dirty surface has occurred as a result of neglect by previous owners, by the attentions and deprivations of 19th century servants. He's working in the historical English context. 
Um, the variable effects of burial in the soil or the primitive cleaning of the archaeologist, and we'll get onto that in a moment, is often quite right. It is frequently not a meaningful or deliberate surface. Loss of evidence as a result of surface cleaning must be set against the visually important truth of the surface and what is uncovered. In other words, one use might erase the traces of a previous use. It's like if you're sanding down wood to get rid of all of the dinks and um, marks on it. Those dinks and marks are telling a particular story, but you're sanding them away. So use wear is a bit more ambiguous than residue analysis. And it brings us on to this question of whether we should clean artifacts or not. So that dirt that is on the artifact, um, that often has information. Um, we measure its pH, we do things like see if it's got phytoliths in it, uh, and we are interested, sometimes it's imported dirt, and there are interesting questions around what is known as dirt. It's certainly not something to throw away. Uh, we also need to be aware of the last use of an artifact. So an artifact that's used for multiple purposes, the kind of classic Swiss Army knife, the last thing you use it for tends to leave the clearest traces. But it might be something that doesn't represent the full use history of that object. So just bear that in mind. The, the traces you see don't necessarily cover all the uses an object was put to. But they do at least cover some of the uses, so they are valuable. So here, for example, in this case study, the stone tool was found, and along this edge over here, certain um, marks were observed. And so a replica stone tool was made, and it was used to tan hide and to take skin and fat off hide, to scrape it off. So here you've got the schematic of a hide pegged out and the stone tool being used. And then by looking at the same area under the scanning electron microscope, you get these distinctive polished areas. So if you find, a, a, so this stone tool's distinctive polished areas were very similar to this experimental stone tool's polished areas, and we have a high degree of confidence that this side of the stone was used as a scraper, for example. That these uses, this polish comes not from, for example, cutting wood, which leaves more deep scored marks across an artifact, but they come from scraping and preparing hide for clothing, containers, all of those kinds of things. Right, so that's, some, that's the analysis section done. Once the analysis is done, we now need to move that material off to what's known as the repository or the collection. This can be at a university, a government department. Typically, it's a museum. Now, the museum has two distinct parts. In this picture, I've got the Western Australian Museum. Um, this is the current museum, and this is the artist's notion of the new museum that will open in 2020. And inside of it, this is from Maritime Museum, part of the same museum complex, you have displays like of the Batavia and other things. So there are a whole lot of objects on display, typically fewer than half of 1% of a museum's archaeological collections are ever on display. The rest of the artifacts are behind the scenes. In this case, the WA Museum has a very large facility um, outside of Perth at Welshpool where it keeps a great many of its collections. I've shown bugs and biological specimens here because there are cultural sensitivities about showing certain of the indigenous materials and they don't want them shown to the world. Um, but they are being very carefully looked after, curated, researched and stored and conserved in this back part of the museum where most of the material is kept. So the, the practice of curation, curation is a very broad word and it essentially just means the care of an artifact. When we look at its original 14th century etymology, it has quite a profound meaning as a, a, cur a curate is a spiritual guide, a person responsible for the care of souls. Um, so a curator is then someone who is responsible for the care of artifacts. The care of artifacts operates on at least two levels. One is um, at a technical level, so you need to know what to be able to do to this artifact to make sure that it survives for as long as possible in as good a condition as possible. But balance it against this is also a cultural sensitivity that might sometimes contradict your um, technical expertise. And I've got as a case study here a photograph of um, the, the parishes, uh, Otis and Sherry Parish, they are Kashaya Pomo, a Northern Californian Native American group. And they're working here in the University of California, Berkeley's Phoebe Hearst Museum. And they're working on various organic materials, drums and basketry. 
Now, as part of normal museum practice, what the Phoebe Hearst Museum does is it fumigates its collections where organic material is. It fumigates them so insects and other little bio biological agents can't destroy the material because they love that sort of material in a museum. The problem with that practice, which is very good museum practice, in an indigenous perspective or this indigenous perspective, is the Kashaya do not consider these to be objects. They consider them to be living things. They're not human, but they are living. And so the one thing you wouldn't do to a living thing in terms of your care for it, in terms of your curation of it, is you wouldn't put a whole lot of poisonous gas in a room with a bunch of people, much less so um, with these objects, for example, or um, things, as Sherry and Otis consider them. So now you have to negotiate a middle way that ensures the preservation of the artifacts. Otis and Sherry both want these artifacts preserved, um, balanced against the cultural sensitivities. So this is a very neglected field of archaeological work, but also a great series of opportunities for it to be done. So curation is about the care and technical and conceptual ways of an archaeological collection, ranging from the smallest artifact to huge assemblages of hundreds of thousands and even millions of individual artifacts. So I've posed the question here about whether these images show artifact, objects or artifacts. In many cases, people will say, well, of course they're artifacts. Here on the left, you have sculpted um, wooden Zuni war gods. The Zuni are a Native American group from the more deserty kinds of areas who would make uh, out of wood. They would make these war gods. They really, they're not a war god as such. They're a very potent, powerful being that is created and with which people communicate through a complex set of relations in order to ensure that all is right with the world. Once that particular ceremony, which has to be done in a very careful way because there are lots of dangerous forces around, once that ceremony is done, those objects, or in the Zuni understanding, those beings, those powerful beings, need to be taken away from where people are living and put in a safe place, such as over here. The problem was when some of the early European travelers, like Frank Cushing, came through um, the Americas, North America, in the 1800s, they saw these and said, what beautiful objects. Today, many of these objects are sold on the art market as pieces of fine art for tens of thousands of dollars. And they said, these Native Americans are throwing away these beautiful objects. They're thrown away, so they're ours to take. They didn't understand the cultural context where they weren't thrown away. They were being put in a safe place to keep people around them safe. Taking them away, though, would be the last thing you should do. And interestingly, there's a coalition today of a number of people who buy these up off the art market, return them to the Zuni, who then dispose of them in this culturally appropriate way. So these are by no means only objects or artifacts. They are also sentient beings that have to be treated in a certain uh, structured set of ways. They, they have obligations to people and people have obligations to them. Moving to southern Africa, we have these vendor rain-making drums. So these are drums that are, are, are beaten um, to make rain. Um, they are also powerful objects, so interestingly they are kept away from where people live, uh, usually in a dark cave. They are then brought out to make rain. They are not considered to be drums, they are considered to be a herd of cattle and that you have to feed them by rubbing ochre and fat on them to keep them well. Now you can imagine what a museum curator would think if you say, um, you need to rub that thing regularly with ochre and fat. Also, um, very often when you move these drums, you hear something inside, something move, pebble-like moving inside. And according to vendor ethnography, that will either be the gastrolus, the little round stones that are in the crocodile's belly. The crocodile is a symbol for the king, and rain making is one of the, the kingly functions. And or they could be some of the bones of a noted rainmaker or king um, inside of this drum. So it's not then just an object, it contains human remains and a whole set of different laws and ways of handling come into being. So I hope you get the idea that the objects are never just objects. They are objects at a certain level, but in their cultural context, they're also so much more. And in terms of our scientific understanding, they also have special places. Curation has a lot of technical aspects and it has a lot of very practical aspects. So number one, you've got to think of costs. People often don't think of it, but how much does each of these boxes cost to curate? Many people say, well, it costs nothing, it just sits on a shelf for years. No, the box, which has to be out of acid-free um, cardboard, lined with acid-free paper, that costs a certain amount of money. 
The labeling that you put on it, that costs a certain amount of money. Shelving costs a certain amount of money. The storeroom had to be built, that costs a certain amount of money. And then of course there are the, the people factors whoops, um, that are involved in this. Um, if I can just get back to where I was. Um, the people factors, all of the, the labeling, the curation, there are hundreds of people hours in each of these boxes. So at a conservative estimate, a small box about this big would probably cost about 300 Australian dollars a year to curate. And look how many boxes you have there in terms of its real costs. Also, you have different materials. Um, iron that is rusting has to be treated differently to, for example, wood. Um, uh, wood that is dry and wood that is waterlogged have to be treated in different kinds of ways. How long are you storing this material for, for example, also affects all of your decisions and actions. Very importantly, the metadata, all of the archaeologists' notes, articles, diagrams, digital files, photographs, all of those different kinds of things have also to be curated so that if someone is wanting to have a look at this box of artifacts, they have access to all of the data that is related to that box. And then there are all the usual legal, ethical and socio-political concerns. Human remains have to be kept in a different part of the collection, for example. If there are repatriation concerns, those need to be dealt with in their specific ways. So it's a very interesting, but also very practical, can often be very contested field curation. Getting on to some of the practical activities, cleaning. Do we do it or don't we do it? So here you've got this great quote, before any treatment is carried out, the object should be placed in its historical, archaeological, or artistic context. So before you clean an artifact, you need to record it as it is then. You need to have what's called a baseline recording, so we know what the object was like, in case we make a mistake in terms of our intervention, whether it's cleaning or whatever it is. So in some cases, cleaning makes a great deal of sense. So here we've got the Sistine Chapel. Over years and years of pilgrims coming there, the soot from their lamps, um, these days, industrial pollution, etc., obscures the very vibrant colours that Michelangelo and others um, originally painted this on. Interestingly, one of the first conservation attempts for the Sistine Chapel happened a few decades, I think about 30 years after it was painted, where people used stale bread and vinegar to remove the soot from candles. Today, we would never use such a primitive technique, but at the time, that was the correct technique to use. So this is a good instance of why we clean, although there was careful recording done before the cleaning, during the cleaning, and then the cleaned product. But there are also some instances of where cleaning is disastrous, often done with very good intentions. So from a few years ago, reported in the New York Times, um, there was a French youth group that went to Montebal Cave. And this is an upper Paleolithic cave that has um, rock art that's about 15,000 years old, and they decided to clean the graffiti off the cave. Now, number one, graffiti is an artifact and should be recorded because it gives us certain social values, etc. Um, but number two, you know, to do this stuff without an archaeologist or heritage specialist is disastrous. So in this case, you can read the punchline here or the end line here. They damaged a portion of the cave's 15,000-year-old bison paintings before realizing what they were. So, so focused were they on cleaning the graffiti, only later did they go, oops, there's a 15,000-year-old bison panel underneath this, and we've taken some of it away, and we can never put it back again. So think very carefully before you clean something. Do a careful study, a feasibility study, the reasons for and against cleaning, and always very careful records. There's a science to cleaning. I'm not going to go on to this a whole bunch more. This is conservators. Um, well, give us the appropriate advice here. But we don't just have dirt, we have primary and secondary material, decay products, soiling one, soiling two, depending on whether it's a primary or, or secondary product. So there are different kinds of dirt that are an object. Some of them can be quite interesting. For example, in one museum collection, the, the famous elephant man in England um, had a hood over his head. And that hood, uh, because um, he was considered to be so uh, ugly to people around him, Afterwards, that hood, which was kept in a museum collection, thankfully it was never cleaned, and the residues, the suppurating sores, um, the bodily fluids of the elephant man could be studied, and the form of elephantitis that he had identified. Similarly, soldiers from the First World War's pants that had turnips at the bottom of the pants collected soil from, for example, the Somme and Heap and Gallipoli, which in the soil could then be analysed to see... Um, um, what the environment was like that these soldiers were fighting in. 
So here's a more meaningful cleaning. So in this case, we have an Anglo-Saxon bowl. It has certain um, damage to it that was obscured by a thick crust of dirt. So when the dirt is obscuring in information, obscuring detail, it can give us information, then it should be removed. When the dirt is part of the decay process, then it should be removed. Other cases like this, you can be non-invasive. So on Blackbeard, the pirate shipped the revenge. Um, the sword guard was found, so the bit of the sword between the handle and the blade was found. And by non-destructive techniques such as x-rays, uh, more precise detail could be seen from the corroded, um, the corroded example. And this small hole where a decorative chain would have hung off was revealed that was invisible to here. So sometimes you don't need to clean. Sometimes you can use other means. There's also an ethic to cleaning. I've singled out here a firm called Odyssey. They are salvors or treasure hunters. They are definitely not archaeologists. So what they do is they go out and they dive on shipwrecks. They salvage them. But they don't work like an archaeologist. As an archaeologist, all artifacts are equally valuable, whether it's a small bit of broken pot or a gold coin. They tell us a different story and they exist together in a context. People like this firm simply go in and treasure hunt. They look for the pretties and they destroy a lot of archaeological contexts. They then clean the coins to a state that in fact the coins have never existed in, even when they were freshly minted, because they are selling these online to collectors. Um, if it's not part of a proper permitted archaeological or heritage activity, this is definitely not on in terms of um, the ethics and indeed the legalities very often. And also using material from looted assemblages um, is also not on. All right, so analysis. We did do a section on analysis before the repository, but the repositories themselves have labs in which to do analysis. So for example, here an x-ray done of this Buddha, this Khmer Buddha, shows that at some point in the past there was a conservation intervention um, um, by putting a metal rod into a statue that had otherwise broken. So we do still more analysis in order to confirm the age, cultural affinity and possible meanings of an object. It just adds to the knowledge, the cumulative um, adding of layers of knowledge. And very importantly for the repository, it informs them about what the correct conservation measures for that object or those objects would be. So analysis never really ends even when an object is in the repository. Other practical things are labels and storage. So over here what you have is you have a label that fish moths and silverfish have um, eaten their way through. So the site code is no longer visible. Also, at some point, the adhesive keeping this label onto this, plast um, this, this cardboard is going to fall off. This is a bad cardboard box. It's got lots of acid in it. And it's going to damage the artifacts. And um, we now these days have things like barcoding, digital matrix, RFIDs as ways of labeling our boxes and our artifacts. These digital ways are really good because not only do they allow for collections security, elections, collections auditing, but they immediately put you in touch with all the metadata that's sitting around an object, for example. And I'll just go back to this. There's this great article on labeling and tracking objects um, that's worth chasing up. It's really interesting. It's a, it's a series of PowerPoint slides for those of you wanting to, to go a bit deeper into labels and storage. Data and the digital is extremely important. Um, the, artifacts on, the artifacts do not speak. Um, we speak for them in terms of our interpretations, our digital files, our photographs, all of those different kinds of things. Um, and for a long time, just the finding of artifacts, so Leonora Sarson points out here, for decades, record keeping took a backseat to collecting and preserving objects and came to be viewed as a task of secondary importance. Though major problems existed within these information files, they functioned adequately because they were supported by a strong framework of oral tradition. In other words, people at a museum generally worked there for a long time. They could say, oh yes, that so-and-so brought that object in and it's kept in that room over there. But it wasn't always written down. So if that person moved to another job or retired or died, um, that information wasn't available. So you've always got to think not just of the object, but the metadata that goes with it. Together, these constitute our archive from which we can interpret the objects today and by which we preserve the research potential so that those objects can be interpreted in the future. So there are lots of different ways of doing these. All of our digital kinds of files, these can be brought and translated into um, sort of click-on files like UNESCO World Heritage Site and that. Individual objects can have little videos. You play a little QuickTime video 
spins the object around so you can sit in one part of the world and do research in another part of the world. You've got some basic information here, a series of stills, and you can click on a larger PDF for a report that comes on as well as there's a, an academic reference here about work done on the site. So a really nice way of keeping the object and its metadata together. And then finally in this section on curation, we do all of this stuff in order to make our research known. So I've used publishing in brackets and inverted commas here because publishing happens in all sorts of ways. They're peer-reviewed articles, they're newspaper reports, they're web products, they're exhibitions, they're outreach activities, um, podcasts, tweets, Facebook, all of these different kinds of ways of getting information out depending who your audience is. So we use multiple media all the time. Um, you do need to Excavation, for example, is in many ways destruction. You, no one else can re-excavate a site you've excavated. So you have a moral obligation to publish and make known the work you did so that other people can have a look at it and see what's going on over here. And as we can see in this poll, why researchers publish this work? Number one, um, almost 100% to communicate their result to other archaeologists, to advance their career for personal prestige to gain funding. You'll see financial reward is really tiny. You don't get paid for publishing. It's part of your job. Um, and sometimes if you publish books, very often the royalties are given to worthy causes. But all of this work that we do is done so that we can um, let the various publics and interest groups that we serve know about what we're doing. Alrighty. The last section is pseudo-archaeology, so an, another reason to publish is so that we can get reliable information out there, so we can inform people about what is good knowledge and what is more suspect knowledge. And in archaeology, we have a field called pseudo-archaeology. It's a form of junk science, but it captures a lot of attention. Um, programs like Ancient Aliens and those sorts of things reach massive audiences, bigger audiences than we re read in the books like this that we write. Now we acknowledge as archaeologists that we by no means know everything about the past and many surprises await us. Um, but what we do do is we work in a scientific way and pseudo-archaeology does not. So pseudo-archaeology is a pseudoscience focused on the study or promotion of archaeology in ways that do not meet the basic standards of scientific method. So scientific method is simply about making clear what your evidence is how you, um, what the context of that evidence is, how you retrieve the evidence, uh, how you've interpreted the evidence, what analytical techniques you used on the evidence, why you interpreted the way in which you interpreted, and so on. It's almost like a forensic uh, chain of evidence um, that we use. So anyone can come and check our work, and they can either agree or disagree with our findings, but they know how we got there exactly, and we have used established methods of doing this. Pseudo-archaeologists do not to use these methods. Uh, they do use real sites and artifacts, um, but they'll then often do some things that are, are, are just absurd. They ascribe mystical powers to the pyramids or say that alien races came down, alien beings came down to earth and created certain archaeological sites and artifacts. So it's a very popular field um, and as heritage specialists and archaeologists you're going to be confronted with this throughout your career. So it's important you know A, how to identify pseudo-archaeology and B, how you can counter the pseudo-archaeology by showing people the flaws in pseudo-archaeology and then offering a better interpretation. So let's have a look at our case study right here in Australia. There are a number in WA but this one is over in Gosford, so Gosford just north of Sydney over in the east coast of Australia has these hieroglyphs. So you can go there. Um, if you Google Gosford or Woi Woi or Karyong um, and petroglyphs or hieroglyphs or Egyptians, uh, you'll find a whole bunch of things. Interestingly, the one thing you won't find are accredited scientific articles on the site. Now you can imagine an archaeologist, um, if this was real, this would be, uh, this would make your career. You'd be pretty famous after this. The fact that no archaeologists over the last 40 years or more have published on this particular site, with one exception, um, uh, tells you a whole lot of things. The information you get on Woi Woi, Karyong and Gosford are from websites. So remember, websites, anyone can put anything on a website. It's not moderated, it's not peer-reviewed. And websites are a huge mix of some great websites with good information, but most websites in this field just have a whole lot of junk science. So you can see from quite some time ago, some decades ago, is that Initially, this discovery in inverted commas was made. The hieroglyphs are there for sure, uh, 
but there they are on the rock. You can see the picture over there. But whether these were Egyptians or not, now this is another question. You can watch this video here. This is by a family called the Strongs who are convinced that around about 5,000 years ago, Egyptians traveled to the east coast of Australia, interacted with Aboriginal people and left messages behind them. So why don't we think that this is a legitimate interpretation? We've got to think, where does the idea come from? And the idea comes from archaeology and an archaeologist. So back in the 1930s, archaeologists like Edward Slater, and uh, Frederick Slater rather, and a number of other archaeologists believed in a thing called diffusionism. So they said uh, a good idea is invented once, so something like agriculture is invented once in a particular place and then diffuses out to the rest of the world as the inventors travel the world. So in that way, Frederick uh, Slater saw these, these petroglyphs or rock engravings at Gosford and said, hmm, these look a little bit Egyptian. And he was part of it, he was genuinely trying to understand these artifacts in terms of what he could understand. So the 1930s, you can imagine there were some pretty colonial and even racist views of Aboriginal people, that they were not capable of great cultural achievements. Of course, today we know that's just nonsense. But in the 1930s, it was a different ball game. So people said local people, local Aboriginal people, were not responsible for much of what we today know as Aboriginal archaeology. Um, that archaeology was done by outsiders like Egyptians, Phoenicians, a whole bunch of different people. So Slater is often used as a reason for why the, the Gosford or Woi Woi Karyong petroglyphs are Egyptian. But you can imagine this was 1938. No archaeologist today professes this. Our understanding in the last 80 plus years has moved on. You wouldn't, for example, go to a doctor whose training comes from the 1938. 30s and have them perform heart surgery on you. You would go with what the, the current um, training and, and knowledge is. So let's have a look further at how we debunk this myth. So um, Macquarie University, so if it's hieroglyphs, the logical thing to do is get an Egyptologist in, um, that branch of archaeology in over here. So what we have over here is we have um, Professor Boyo Onkinga, he's from Macquarie University. This is the newspaper article explaining why he thinks these are not Egyptian, and here are some of his reasons. I put the Secret Visitors Project website on here. This is by an archaeologist, Dennis Gojak. It's a great little website where he looks at all of these different claims, not just of Egyptians, of Chinese, etc., that were visiting Australia, or said to visit Australia thousands of years ago, and whether they have any validity or not. In many cases, there is validity. There were Macassans, um, people from Indonesia visiting northern Australia, probably for thousands of years. Um, but Egyptians, hmm. So as the professor goes on, he says, first of all, the way they cut is not the way ancient Egyptian rock inscriptions are produced. They're very disorganized. So the method, the means in which these um, engravings are made are not the way Egyptians do those, even allowing for different stone materials. There's also a problem with the actual shapes of the signs that are used. There's no way people would have been inscribing texts from the time of Cheops um, from the signs that weren't invented until 2,500 years later. So there's a chronological discrepancy. In other words, there are hieroglyphs from all sorts of different periods grouped together, which is inconsistent with having a group of Egyptians visit. They would put hieroglyphs in whatever form was current at that time. So what you end up with is gobbledygook. They don't make any sense. You cannot be deciphered by an Egyptologist. He also says it doesn't make sense why ancient Egyptians would be at the particular site. If by any chance they reached Australia, you'd expect them to land on the west coast rather than the east coast. So if they're producing hieroglyphs, they, you would expect to find them here over in Western Australia, for example, um, where they are not. So that's another inconsistency. And where his reportage is good is not only does he debunk the myth to say why it doesn't um, hold water, he goes on to say what the likely explanation might be. So he says here, in the 1920s, when it's likely these engravings were actually made, there was widespread interest in ancient Egypt after the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun. He says that this was also around the time many Australian soldiers who were stationed in Egypt came back from the First World War. And importantly, he says, we have other instances of Australian soldiers having carved and Egyptianizing objects in the Kurangai National Park near Sydney. So this is not an isolated event. There are other known examples of soldiers coming back and carving out um, Egyptian symbols, glyphs, and those kinds of things. 
So that's how we know that there were not Egyptians 5,000 years ago over on the East Coast, and also how we think, uh, who we think the likely authors were and what their reasons were. They weren't van, these were soldiers who were bored, inspired by, by um, e Egyptian culture and decided to engrave them. So when we look at, again at the evidence, there are still other factors. So over here we've got from people who are claiming that these are Egyptian engravings. They're saying, well, look at this tomb in Egypt and look how closely it resembles Gosford. And they say here he has a megalithic style of cutting the rocks, these little marks. Problem is, is lots, as in um, almost a dozen geologists who have no stake in this, have come along and said, well, these are a perfectly natural marks such as you find all over the park. Um, there's nothing cultural about it. Use wear analysis comes in here, and the use wear shows exclusively natural and no cultural processes operating over here. Another thing pseudo-archaeologists do is they'll take an isolated image like this, and they'll say, look, this over here from Carrion looks like the Sumerian scroll seal. Hang on, a couple of things. You've just said they're Egyptians. These are Sumerians, different culture. And does that really look like this? Where are the wings? This looks entirely different. It does not, in fact, look like what is being shown over here. It's a false comparison. So as archaeologists, we pay attention to these details. We weigh them up and whether they are valid or not valid. And in these two cases, they are definitely not valid. Then, importantly, we've got to feel, well, what do indigenous Australians feel about this? So initially, some years ago, a small group said, oh, well, maybe Egyptians did come here and we indigenous Aboriginal people of this area hosted them and they left their marks. Um, it was a very small group of people and they were just being fairly polite to some of the researchers, I think. Unambiguously in 2013, um, the Darkenshing Land Council unambiguously denounced the claim that these were Egyptian hieroglyphs and um, characterised these as pseudoscience. Um, in that area, we do have Aboriginal rock art, such as you're seeing in this picture over here, that is actively being managed by Aboriginal people as part of their ongoing culture. They have no need of this crazy pseudoscience, and they have recognised it as such. Um, I've mentioned this before, but it is important to say we, we don't, as archaeologists, we, we're not here necessarily to adjudicate the truth of things. We are accurate in our methods. Our methods are open to scrutiny by others, and we have many analytical techniques that can show whether things are false. They can't necessarily show always whether things are true, and we should be prepared for many surprises in our interpretations because we don't know what it's all about. In terms of Feynman's, Richard Feynman's comments at the beginning of this lecture, it's, it's a wonderful world out there. We as humans are a very new species on that world, and we've still got a long way to travel. So we really have no need of this kind of pseudoscience, although in itself it's an interesting phenomenon to study. So that's it for this week in terms of analysis, curation and pseudoscience. Um, just wrap up by saying once again that archaeology is a process. It has a before, during and after. And we're very clear and careful about the different steps we take. Analysis. There are lots of different kinds of analysis we can perform. It all just depends on what we want to know, how we want to know it, and what resources we have available to us. Curation. All the museums in the world need more curators and conservators. You can do research just on museum collections. You don't even have to go out and do field work. You can do conservation projects on various uh, museum collections and on, on actual sites as well. And then pseudo-archaeology, we've got to deal with it. It's interesting, it's irritating, um, but it can cause damage uh, to people whose history it actually is. You know, if the aliens came down and built the pyramids, why are there copper tool marks on the sandstone block? Surely you'd expect some sort of super-duper laser. And a lot of Egyptians get really irritated, and more than irritated, they are offended greatly when people say aliens came down and built this, rather than recognizing their genius and science and back all those thousands of years ago. So thanks very much. That's it for today, and um, hope that was of interest.